Great. My name is Jenna Hamid. I am the programs manager at Center for Book Arts, um, currently on Lenape territory. Um, thank you so much for joining us for the first installment of our spring 2021 Broadside Reading Series curated by Purvi Shah. The theme of this season series is healing futures, attending wounds, tending lineages. The Broadside Reading Series is one of the center's longest running public programs featuring writers in the spring and fall seasons, collaborating with the Center for Book Arts community of printers to create a collection of limited edition letterpress printed broad broadsides. The collaboration explores the relationship of text, image, and design, incorporating the artist's visual conveyance of the writer's poetry. We're so grateful to be working with Purvi, who describes her curation process as gathering writers who tend lineages while facing harms, while holding close the lifeblood of harm, who can marvel even when there are not answers, for living is marvelous. We're joined tonight by, by the certainly marvelous Emma Kadjo and Aurora Masum Javid, as well as artist Rowan Renee. Keith Graham is not able to join us this evening and I'll be presenting his broadside on his behalf. This program would not be possible without the support of poets and writers through the public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, as well as support from our vibrant community. While a donation tonight is not expected or necessary, it's certainly appreciated. We also hope that you'll join, a, join us next week for our first ever virtual benefit, celebrating connections ignited by the book arts. Sliding scale tickets are available at centerforbookarts.org slash benefit 21. We'd also like to note that in honor of AAPI Heritage Month, all proceeds from purchases go to Broadside's tagged AAPI Voices in our bookshop and will be donated to our friends at Kundeman, a national organization dedicated to the creation and cultivation of Asian American creative writing. So now I'll turn it over to Pravisha and the poets. Welcome everyone. It's a joy to be together here with you for Healing Futures. Um, I want this togetherness tonight to actually feel like a presence. We will definitely have poetry, we will have conversation, we will have art. And first I wanted to take an opportunity to root us where we are. I am joining you all from unceded the Napa and Canarsie lands in Brooklyn, New York. It is beginning to be spring here, though it is almost like full spring and I want it to be warmer. Wherever you are, I hope there are many springs and abundance. To bring us together and in ourselves and spirits and bodies, I invite you to do this somatic grounding with me. It is all an offer. Do what feels comfortable. So if you are able, feel free to take your hands and just rub them together. You will notice fire and heat, this life force that you have within you, this life force that is sometimes challenged, threatened, endangered by the world around us. And yet there it is, this life force in your hands. When it feels right to you, Feel free to take this heat that you have generated and either press it to your heart or press it towards the screen. Thank you all for sharing your energy. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your generations.
thank you for your ancestors and thank you for you. I am so delighted this evening to have with us Amakojo and Aurora Masun Javed to share their incredible lyrics and startling, brilliant revelations with us. I'm gonna read a couple of my own poems and then Aurora will read and then Ama will read. But before they do, I wanted to share just a little bit about why I find them so marvelous. When we talk about healing, and particularly when we think about Ama's work and Aurora's work, healing is not an industry, but actually a reckoning. And when we think about Ama's work, I think about the patience and revelation she brings to it. As she talks about her poem, Bearing Seeds, she says, I was only able to write a tercet in the evening before bed and then one or two more during a day of writing. This became the rhythm. I had to listen for it to come at its own pace, sometimes interrupting my dreams. In one of my favorite poems of hers, Blueprint, she writes, when I rose, I left the print of a woman behind. There are so many women, so many ghosts, so many presences, so many prints. It would take many lifetimes to unravel all that Amma bears witness to, that brings to us that brings forward, that excavates from soil into something that can also blossom. When she says in Thoroughbred, a clock doesn't know what time means. The horse has no words for yesterday or tomorrow. And the pain you read on my sloping face isn't real, far from it it doesn't mean anything at all. We have here before us in these words, not only the feeling of trauma, but a lesson in how to feel it, in how to touch it, in how to sense it. We have a reckoning of time. We have, in short, revelation. This kind of reckoning of time also happens in Aurora's poetry. I fell in love with Aurora's poems many, many years ago, partly because of my also obsession with time and general geek nature in that cosmos. In her prize-winning poem, Singularity, Aurora writes, I met, meet my mother in a bar. I am a glass of ice and she is thirsty. Here, there is this imagined lineage of daughter and mother and grandmother. And Aurora writes in this poem, quote, she hates the sound of my voice, says I laugh like a wounded dog. I plug my ears and no one wins. Here, there is not a single story, but a multiverse. Time is not collapsed, but expansive. Even when the heart is collapsed, there is resilience that expands. Somehow singularity is also opportunity, is also presence, is both the wound and its remaking. Or as Aurora writes in Portrait of My Mother as a Mermaid, I named you Aurora for a reason, light, that should not be. I hope this evening that you will join me in marveling at the light that Amma and Aurora bring us, at marveling at the grief that they lay bare and the ability for us to touch, to reckon, to feel what grief might not only be like, but taste like, germinate like, to be like light. Before I pass it off to Aurora, I'm gonna read a couple of poems 
that are in conversation with their work. So these are a couple of poems from my recent book, Miracle Marks, and you'll see some of the interweaving of the themes. Beating her soul closed, Saraswati reaches God and bursts into tears. Where the river pulls off red veil or living shroud, a tiger sparks in woman's breasts. When no one is watching, the tiger learns to swim. It follows the river as river makes, as if there were no day nor night, no moons to keep mark. The river has nowhere to be, no one to carry, no fabric to fold, no burst to assume, no opinion to praise, no red blotches to whiten, no sleep to solitaire, nowhere to hide sore breasts, no need to compete. The black cloud for lavish rains, nowhere to go as it is always going there, there always going, absorbing curd of sea, absorbing salts off a girl's thigh, blood off a woman's smile. Forgive your smeared compound, layer for your cramp scrap, piles for everything that is usable, the stack of your own future limbs. You want the power to turn a trident into a spoon, your hand as the first cup from which a toddler drinks. You believe you can talk to river, calm it down, reason it. Woman, have you not learned? You may birth your ruler. You feel every destination but perfection in this lifetime. Your sore skin as moon origin, as bountiful contamination. At rivers gather clumped fabrics of you. Measure 21 feet, measure 27 feet. These waters, how they bear scar rings, tried wombs, incarnations that could never be seen. After encountering tiger, I spun my destiny as only water can, moving without moving, being without breaking whole. My lifetimes are prowling since this river conceived. Women rip around me, keening longings, tiding hopes. Mark the streaks of my salvation. These spilled wants come apart, come home. Mark the blood of my limbs, once they were river too. And just because of colonialism. Saraswati nods to the white man who, after hearing her liberation poems, embroiders dowry. Even now, goddesses outlast colonialism. Thank you again all for being here this evening. And I pass it now to Aurora. Thank you so much, Purvi. That was, oh, my heart. <laughs> my heart is so full. Um, I am so grateful to be with all of you. Uh, I'm so grateful to be reading with Ama, who is one of my all-time favorite poets. And so I feel uh, like very, <laughs> very lucky. Um, and to be part of this magical project of making poems into broadsides. So thank you, um, CBA. And, and yeah, I'm just so grateful. So I'm gonna start with uh, a poem about birth and then I'll share a poem about grief and then I'll pass it to Ama. And we're gonna do um, a duet where we sort of move back and forth uh, intuitively and, and kind of feel how our poems might be in conversation and might speak to each other. Um, so I'll read two poems and then pass it. So the first poem is um, called Blood Milk. Blood Milk. The blood begins to seep a mile in, conjured river, 
red seam unspooling along thigh, and I let it. Why not? Why not let the body do what it does? For nine months, my mother's blood fall paused, swelled and surged instead, voluminous in our ripening organ, our cord shared breath, our counterpoint pulse. Beside the creek, my blood stains stone, and I am grateful to exist. 33 years ago in a hospital in New Jersey, a woman who looked something like my mother wrapped her fists around the ragged rails of her breath and pushed for three days, alone. Mind, morphine bleary, death, her nearby companion. How long since he'd beaten her? This is how we are born. Skull splitting contractions and then beginning, beginning. She gave the girl a name, round and fertile, electric and unlikely. She wanted the child to sing her blood song like a grass-stained sky, innocent, eternal. Every time she spoke herself into the world, a name singular as Mecca. The nurse refused to sign the birth certificate, rebuking the ocean lilt of syllables and the mother, small and brown and bleeding, threatened to call the governor. Find me a phone, she said. Her daughter, not a day old, already learning the cost of being her own. No one taught the mother how to feed the girl and the baby wouldn't latch. Raven-eyed cacophony, how it must have frightened them both. Who else to blame? Has this always been our story? My mother battling to survive and me begging her gaze to please, please meet mine. How will it end? Here on the stones where I let go what I dare not hold, where rhizome and rapture teem, my cells circle within her still and her blood milk within me. Who can say, who can trace one body's edge or find where our blood begins? How might we know our bones? Marigold and wet clay and dark ubiquitous matter impossible to reach. What is a story? Let me call this hajj, this bleeding. Every day I am born, crimson with want. The walls dissolve and there is only the mother her child, the pain of milk. I press my tongue to her breast. I taste what is ours in the bed of that first severed day. I lay myself down, I lay it all down. And the second poem is called The Bridge, The Gate. I have to scroll. I have <laughs> been working on a manuscript and it's now very, very, it's like 90 pages. So uh, it takes a long time to find things. The bridge, the gate. The patrolman approaches slow. Scared, I will jump. He is so young. Palms, like the word please. I have no intention today of leaving my body. I've paused only to watch the surfers collide with the Pacific. Strange symmetry, what the wave gives, what it takes. Where one bails beneath the break, another glides to shore. See, I want to say, we live. Every poem contains the dead, creatures worrying the bones, buffalo, elephants, men. I have the habit of avoiding funerals. Instead, I pretend, I keep, play Scrabble with Rangananu, her nose too close to the board. She never says, all my friends are dead. She never loses her sight. Her words never collapses into coma, then gone. Listen, how Brian still calls just cuts. 
giddy spring kiss another boy's lips. I never pride about the girls. His mother never finds him hanging. We try to kill things in ourselves daily. Regret the unsaid, our fathers. But the body is an archive even as it burns. My amma is sick and I linger on a bridge. The sea exhales, mist swallowing pier, coastline, city, everything awash. Even this will end. Who would we be if we held all of it? Grief, history, each other, soft as the fawn's unflinching stare. I admire the forest floor, log decaying, root reaching for root, no partition. What rots, feeds, what was, is, even as. Thank you, and I'll pass it to um. Come on, y'all. I don't even know what to do. Like, <laughs> it's really good. Aurora, amazing poems. Ah, oh. and Pervy, just such gorgeous work, such gorgeous opening. And I feel so like tethered to everyone. <laughs> Um, it is a blessing to make a space real. And I just so appreciate everyone's presence and presences. Um, and I want to thank the Center for Book Arts as well. And Ro and Renee for the work on the broadside. And just feel, so, I feel so lucky to be a poet and just to be able to just listen to song. Um, so, you know, Aurora starting with, with Blood Milk um, reminded me of this long poem, which is the title poem of my forthcoming poetry collection. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read that in response. It's called Lewis Nude. One, when my mother was pregnant, she drove every night to the Gulf of Mexico, leaving her keys and a towel on the shore. She waded into the surf, floating naked on her back, turquoise waves hemming her ears. She allowed the water to do the carrying. It isn't true. My mother lived hours inland and her doctor prescribed bed rest. I want her to be weightless, belly up and moonlit, or filling a bathtub with hot water and stepping gingerly so as not to slip, easing herself into the cramped tub rimmed with dirt from her husband and son, soaking for as many minutes as she could, savoring the water as it turned cold. Two, in the news, there was another incident. If I describe how the officer treated the young woman's body, I am also describing the color of her body. Let me refuse simile. I do not wish to write it. Three, in the flower of my body, blossoms belonging at last to me, sovereign place, where I am no one but myself, peony and cracked vase, weeping beech and spiraled shell, siren, matron, Jezebel. A rush of bees enters me and I am not stung. Petals unfold in night's bluest hymn. Four, the blue swimming pool, the blue in a record's groove revolving, the pink hydrangea turned powder blue, glory of the snow blue, blue black blue, the blue of a bruise, wild blueberry blue, the blue you pick, the blue you choose, the blue that bucks us like a bull, 
the blue bowl full of lilacs, the blue that falls as tufts of hair from the barber's chair, the blue sun makes the blue shade of a yellow pine, television blue, cadmium blue, blue twisted into the spools of your DNA, forking into two directions, blue darkening your knees, the blue you missed because though it almost killed you, blue was for a season your home. Five. There was another incident. If I describe how the officer treated the young woman's body, I am also describing the color of my body. Six. Then the last piece, a solemn veil lifted and tossed to the floor. I know the history of my body is a pair of hacked off hands playing the piano. Day after day in the artist's studio, I smell the melon's ripe decay. I draw a second body, then a third, and so on. My bodies reveal nothing and conceal nothing. Pin up beauty, run away, Venus of the circus act, night walker, wet nurse, odorless, reclining nude. The women are me and are not only me. Ours are the only eyes. We construct our seeing as clay or wood into figurines of air. We perceive their shapes and uses just as wind is seen by watching leaves. These are the paintings I make of myself. Art is drawn on the cave of my body. There are as many walls inside me as there are bones at the bottom of the sea. It matters little how small I am in the pool of another's eye. It's awe or indifference I crave. I want to be seen clearly or not at all. The moon is an eye flung open, useless without a pupil. It soothes me, this not seeing. Painters have gone blind staring at the sun. At the center of a hurricane is an eye in the midst of which one believes the storm is over. A woman's face can break, fall as quickly as night. Sometimes when I cry, all the eyes which are mine, painted, sketched, photographed, begin to shed blue tears. I catch them with my hands or with pots and pans or let them fall as drifts of snow I eat them by the fistful. When you look at me in our most intimate exchanges, you drape my nakedness in a fabric I neither sewed nor bought. You pin my beauty with a tack against a wall or me against a four poster bed, thighs splayed, nipples spilling spoiled milk. And every light the fact of history strips me blue. These are the conditions. The point is to go on. Drawing myself as water from a well, I can no longer believe in an innocence that was never mine. It is impossible to draw a self-portrait without the other women figured onto my flesh like barnacles fixed to a gray whale. I am rough to touch. I am the yellow song of a blue pain. The women and I walk a tightrope of night. Our eyes adjust to growing darkness. We make of our vision knowingness. It's love the women and I make. Love fashions our sight. We drink from the waters that were once snow. We are quenched and we are thirsty. Thank you. What? <laughs> oh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Amma. Um, because you read a, a long poem, I'll also read a long poem um, that is considering water. Um, and it's, it's new, so it's a draft. It's definitely not finished. To water we return, for the daughters who are mothers and those who are not, 
for Nora. We watch the image blur and morph like silver schools of fish, ultrasound wand drifting inside you. Honey, the doctor says, breathe. She searches for a heartbeat, your hand in both of mine. You've been here before. You've lost the pregnancy twice before. Silence, monstrous ghost. This time, she finds it. 0.38 centimeters. An ant, a tiny pea, a white speck pulsing. Our eyes, like your ovaries, like little seeds. This is love, I think. In eight months, your child will be born. On that first day, she will soundlessly sleep on my chest as you rest. Her heartbeat, a felt thing, a rhythm against my skin. Welcome, I will say to her, welcome. How strange we two were once so small. Pinprick tap the coming what gallops, what cleaves. What did my mother feel when I fluttered on the screen? Who held her hand? And what of the day I arrived? Repairing what I'd torn, what did she long for then? I was afraid to go home, she said, to him. Ocean away from whom she loved. Monsoon, lush, trapped instead with a violent man. Did you want a child? I asked her once. When you were young, I mean. It was just what you did, she said. You got married, had a kid. There was no question of want. What desire had to die in my mother for me to be born? Amniotic from amnion vase in which the blood of sacrifice is caught. You too will bear it. The animal pain, the aching dunes of your breasts, back, hips, you will bear it and you will thrust your child into her life, the one she will live away from you. This year, like most, my mom's phone calls saturate with worry. Get rid of your catch buy gold, sanitize your peaches, walk backwards. You can't understand, she says. You're not a mother. What if I never become a mother? Before this child chose your water, when you still feared your body, when mine had gone months untouched, we sat by the river, wild roses shedding onto shoals, scraps of wet silk swept away. All our insides swept away. What remains? What remains along the bank? Your child, when she's ready, will come quick. Her hands a wrinkled blue. She will not cry, but she will coo. I will hold her and sing. Somewhere in the distance, my mother's voice will fill the air like rain. Fule fule tole tole ba he ki ba mri tu bai. The water in our bodies, ancient. Ocean which began us, ocean which will one day weather our bones. The water sings inside the glowing bud that is your child and we listen. We listen. What does it feel like, I ask? my palm to your womb. Relief, you say, to want a child this way, desperately, how it must alter the mothering. Within you, the sound waves assemble an echo we can see, heartbeat, a flickering tide. Child, you will name Iris. Child, you will press to your breast as our mothers pressed us to theirs our only survival, their willingness to give. I imagine my mother and I before the Pacific, 
the red hem of her skirt aflame in the breeze. Ma, I want to say, the green grows greener even here. The birds, the birds, for the ways I fail to love, for the wild percussion I do not heed, forgive me, for the bitter salt of my tongue, for the days I crave with greed for what I have not forgiven, forgive me. I once wanted us to be good, to be good for each other. I take now what we have, her voice in my ear, mine in hers, reaching. The doctor prints a strip of photos, somewhere in the gray life. Outside, the death tolls climb. Every minute of every hour, someone dies. Grief ocean us. When I pray, it is to the wise ones yet to arrive. Granddaughters, descendants, they are who I trust. The world they dream into being, the world we ought to tend. Future swelling like an earth inside you. Relief, you say again, and hope. In praise of what is possible, in praise of the sea our mothers create, I am. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. This is what I would like to do all days. <laughs> do it. Aurora. <laughs> Thank you for these beautiful poems. Thank you. Um, the mother is 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 coming and threading in and out of our reading. So lavish darkness. My mother raised me to take what I need. From the wind, I take hunger. From hunger, lust. From the men who shed condoms like molt I take green, a plant I have trouble keeping alive, a hammer from my father to build or dismantle, a cup of nails glittered with rust. From my sisters I take a milk bright bone, architecture of my dreams. From the men who have come inside me I take a muffled cry deprived of tears. I bring bread to my mouth without blessing it, I gaze at the sky without falling to my knees. From the apple tree, I steal a pale green apple. On its skin, I taste salt from the nearby sea. From the air, I take a painless breath robbed from the clutches of saplings and sun. From the men who undress me with their eyes, I fashion a dress dangling with knives. From blades of grass, I make a bright green bed its canopy sheer and billowing. From water, I claim a rippling portrait torn from the background of blurry pines. In all this taking, I manage somehow to keep my wants obedient and small. I need a want bigger than my needs. My mother was raised to take what she was given. She offers me her empty hands. At first, I see nothing but gaps between fingers, swirls and lines crisscrossing her palms. What is my inheritance? I begin to understand. Lavish darkness, driftwood on the beach, emptiness between branches, restless wind. The first night of winter, the first man I slept with was cold. It was the middle of winter when we met. The wind turned our ears tender and pink. When I said, I'm cold, he stayed silent. Like the wind, the silence burned my ears. In a flash, I saw him clearly, fairly and dove my hands deeper into my coat. 
we rushed inside the restaurant filled by a warm, rosy light. As we unraveled the scars from our necks, we smiled at each other, laughing at the cold, wiping the tears from our eyes. Etymology of a mood. Sometimes I feel like a goddess with many hands, except human. One hand is amber gloved, dripping with honey, and two constantly shoo the flies. Two hands play Miss Mary Mack, while two pairs clap to Rock and Robin. In my hand, a dictionary. In my hand, the ash of want. In my hand, a teacup whose emptying bears my face. In my hands, a firefly, a sprig of rosemary between thumb and forefinger. In my hand, a pinwheel resemb resembling the dahlias in my hand. What is the word for this feeling? What is the root of that word? Tell me what to call a twin who survives the other. Not widow, not orphan and why light defines a shadow. Tell me what year the sun will fail or when the word moons began to convey the passage of time. Sometimes I fall asleep petting my hair with six hands. By now, all the hairs in this house are mine. At night, I hear the spider's velvet legs crossing the web that if disturbed will stick to the fingers of one of my hands. My right hand holds a bell, the left hand rings. The last of my hands, I am ringing. Thank you. These hands, these hands and these hungers. Oh, um, poor V, how, how many more should we do? <laughs> uh, well, I would say infinite, but uh, maybe one more round. Okay. Um, I will read a poem about hunger as well then. Just have to find it. <laughs> So when I, um, when I was working on this poem, I was thinking about augurs um, who were priests that observed the signs of birds uh, in ancient Rome. Murmuration. There's so much in this life I don't know how to fathom. So I buy dead women's skirts at estate sales, croon that country song about murdering your husband, I've dated so many white men, it's become pathological. I'm exhausted by my seasons. After insisting on a fifth gin, the stranger pinned me in an alley and I liked it. I didn't wonder who will his sons become. This morning, fog haloed the neighborhood, veiled the empty lot and it's dented no trespass sign. I want to go where I please. Obey hunger's exquisite cleave. With no one to touch me, I fuck myself against a wall. Rose quartz dildo and my own soft hand, I come so quickly I think I must be God. I've always wanted what isn't mine to have, the white mother in the movie. I trip over the power line scrawled thick across pavement. Wind ravishes the black tarps nailed to each gutted roof. Maybe this world wasn't meant for us, but we make do. Even in her illness, my mother paints a canvas a day, her hands quick as her mind once was. She believes she can and so she does. I want to be my mother's daughter. My mother wants me to be my mother's daughter, but I am a slow beast and still running. Each March, a ragged inch of my heart falters. A year older, another year without the love I fear I want. And what if it never comes? If I never have the house in the woods, 
the daughter, the mischievous possum in the yard, what then? What will I make of my leftover life? The spotted hawk rides the wind legions above our fallen lines. Crows pepper the ruins, the starlings swarm and spread. You like them birds, a neighbor calls. I do, I do. Even they are bound and reaching, alone and with. This is all I am. This is all there is. Into my one hallowed name, I walk. And then I'll read one more. What language can break? I write what may destroy us. The colonizer's mouth robust in mine. Our past twisted like a sheet. I can't remember the book I came looking for. And every time I talk to my mother, she's lost something old. Memory torn against throat skull, mouth door, headscape. She used to trip against English this way. Eh, for every misplaced noun. Telephone, stop sign, power. I demanded she find it, object, hardened into syllable, I demanded she build the bridge. As I lounged on the other side, American terror, articulate your desire, I didn't say. And now she can't. In Bangla, I still confuse Basha for Basha, language for home. Where is my language? When is my home? Balke, both yesterday and tomorrow. How will we remember our future? At five, I refused my first eloquence. No one talks like you. Who would I be if my mouth could stand expansion? What girl in her might I know? What woman in myself? Oh, what English cannot bear to sing. Thank you. What I want, where I want this book, please, please. <laughs> um, thank you so much. The canvas reminded me of this poem um, called Poem After an Iteration of a Painting by Lynette Yadom Bioche destroyed by the artist herself. A few times a week, Yadam Boache painstakingly cuts oil paintings she believes aren't up to snuff. Instead of repriming the canvas, she reduces it to two by two and a half meter pieces. She begins again. This isn't an ars poetica. Once I made love in daylight. It was a Saturday or Sunday in November or July. My lover and I stumbled toward the bedroom, turning our mouths and our stock like waists. I don't remember if I undressed myself. The edge of the bed felt precipitous. I've forgotten almost everything about that day except the competing limbs of kissing, walking, fucking, how confused my feet were until at last they did not touch the floor. It was my fault. I wanted so little. This is not a love poem, not a catalog of attempts. Yadam Boache doesn't set her figures in time or place. They are composites of photographs, magazine cutouts, and the occasional life drawing. She doesn't call them portraits. When she scissors her failures into unmendable bits, she aims to deter scavengers and thieves. In the room where I write this, my hands smell like ginger gold apples. For hours, I've been looking out the window, 
staring into the hallway we took to my bedroom. I know the sky is a blue wall. I know the walls were sky blue. Memory paints them yellow. I'll keep this revision. The rest I've thrown away. After a year of forgetting, now I will learn how to tie an apron and unclasp my bra from behind. I will become hard like a moss covered rock. I'll be stiff as a nightgown dried on the line. When the pond freezes over, I'll walk to its center and lie face up until it is May and I am floating. I'll become an anchor pitched skyward. I will steer chiseled ships, spinning fortune splintered wheel. I will worry over damp stones. I will clean ash from the Madonna's cheek using the wet rag of my tongue. I'll make myself shrine-like in porcelain. I will stand still as a broken clock. I will be sore from lovemaking. I will become so large, my hair loosened will be mistaken for the swallow's cave. After June, there is a year of forgetting. After the forgetting, antlers adorn the parlor walls. Then it snows and I'll be coarse. I'll be soft as my mother's teeth. I'll be sugar crystals and feathery snow. I'll be fine. I will melt. I will make children from office paper. They'll be cut from my stomach wearing blank faces. Bald and silent, they will come out of me triplicates holding hands. I will smooth their foreheads with a cool iron. I will fold the tepid laundry, turn down the sheets, then slip, sleepwalk along the Mississippi until it is ocean and I'm its muddy saint. I will baptize myself in silt in December. I will become a pungent earthly ball. I'll pillar to salt. I'll remember the pain of childbirth. Remember being born. So I'm going to read one last poem that will introduce uh, the artist's uh, choice of poem so we can start to talk about these broadsides, these gorgeous broadsides that were made for Aurora and myself. So the poem is called Becoming a Forest. Not to feel the grasses brush my knees as if wading for the first time into the ocean, but a different prayer. This was after declaring, these trees are my bones. And I could feel myself loosed from tendons, muscles, and sinew, a skeleton knocking as a chime against nothing. And in my marrow, the blood of sap, the rungs of pine cones, and myself inside myself, telling me this, to make an alphabet of stammering, a song of a cry, to be anything buzzing with blood or wings, anything alive, including grief. Because isn't that, I ask the trees, my bones forest framing me, what my long ago dead dreamed, tossed in their short allowance of night. All right, thank you all for listening and sharing. So it's my absolute pleasure, pleasure um, to introduce Rowan Renee. So I'm gonna read Rowan's bio. Rowan Renee is a genderqueer artist currently working in Brooklyn, New York. Their work addresses intergenerational trauma, gender-based violence, and the impact of the criminal justice system through image, text, and installation. Their work, No Spirit For Me, 2019, was included in the critically acclaimed exhibition, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, created by Dr. Nicole R. Fleetwood at MoMA PS1. And I just have to say, I was uh, just blown away by the care um, that Rowan took. And I also like shout out to Shana, who is here. Um, who also made a broadside. <laughs> and I was like astounded by the amount of work 
that it takes to make this hand press broadside. Um, so I just feel really lucky and fortunate to have collaborated with Rowan on this. And I can't wait to, for you all to see um, what Rowan made. So please welcome Rowan. Thank you so much, Amma. That's, a, that's such a lovely introduction. And I am also very excited to present and um, also to like engage with, with your work. And I think, you know, um, what called to me in it was the visual, visuality of your poems and like the way images just like keep transforming and like almost shape shifting. And I felt like I could see it in my head or see like while I was reading. And, and I think that um, is something I tried to capture. Um, but I will show you um, what this is and it hopes that my, uh, let's see, can everybody see that? Okay. Um, so I, the, the, the central image is the, the transformation of, of the the trees and the bones, um, where the trunks are bones, and um, the the there's a couple iterations, and like Ama, like it was really helpful to be in dialogue with Ama about building this image into something that I think um, expresses something visually. I don't know, <laughs> um, but I'll show you also a little bit about um, the process of of actually printing. Um, one of the things that was really exciting was um, to actually be able to do handset type at uh, Center for Book Arts. Um, there are many different fonts and I don't know, I think there's hundreds of fonts here, it's amazing. Um, but you, you have to set every letter. Um, and I think that gives just like a depth of um, time to spend with someone's words. And I really loved that about this process. Uh, and the feeling of like knowing the poem from like setting it this way. Um, and I guess the, the visual part, um, it, it's a polymer plate. It's not hand carved. I've done that in the past, um, but it, there, I was able to like draw and uh, digitize it and, and um, it gets made through a photo uh, emulsion process into like a, like a polymer plate. And then that goes on to the press bed and um, it's printed, it, this was three colors um, in, in layers. Um, yeah, so this is the poem uh, I'll, I'll set in the press bed. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, put them in the chat and later I'm happy to answer. And I can turn this over to Jenna, um, who's gonna present Keith's work. Thank you, Rowan. Thanks for sharing that. It's amazing to see the process. It really is astounding to see the transformation and the interpretation of the poem. So um, I will be presenting on Keith Graham's behalf. Keith Graham is an artist and educator born in Bend, Oregon and currently living in New York City. Keith's prints, installations and artist books combine crisp representation and casual experimentation to address themes including elegy, memory, place and emptiness. His work is driven by close observation of his surroundings and reflects a fascination with details of everyday life, drawing from sources such as personal history, the built environment, song lyrics, and conversation fragments. He currently is involved in a long-term collaboration print project with the Virginia-based artist, Dean Das, entitled Dimness, which, will, which concluded in fall 2017. So um, I'm gonna share some images. So this is the process. Um, oh, and I need to read his description too. I'm gonna to read it while I flip through these images. Uh, 
Aurora's broadside is printed on 300 pounds Crane's Letra, which is on all cotton, heavier weight, but very soft paper that takes impression nicely. The poem is set in Helvetica with stymie for colophon and a mix of typefaces for the titles. All from the center's collection. The fluorescent lines are printed from linoleum blocks. In designing this broadside for the We the Gentle Beasts, we, for We Gentle Beasts, I wanted to respond to the earthiness and sense of movement in the poem. I was thinking about ways to suggest old and new, living in the present moment and eulogizing the past. Points of inspiration were French title pages, which are strict in their alignment and often feature a beautiful mix of black and red inks and, play, and playful 20th century designers such as Ettore Statas and Natalie du Pasquier. To me, the decorative letters used in the title, particularly the more Baroque ones, almost become an embodiment of the poem's protagonist. This is the handset type that Keith set. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we have time for some questions um, and there will be plenty of answers. Feel free to drop questions into the chat. Um, and I just wanted to start off again with gratitude um, to all of the artists here um, and also to Jenna and Devin and the Center for Book Arts team for making possible um, this collaboration of art and language and feeding um, really this connection because art is not just an individual genius practice. And so we also wanted to embody that in the way that um, we did our reading today. So thank you all. Thank you for being here and being an essential part of the evening. So. I have a question, um, which is really to hear um, Ama and Aurora from y'all. Like, who do you kind of feel is your conversation partner as you're working through these poems? Um, and or, um, is a choose your own adventure question, and or um, what community do you find, do you return to in those sticky places when, you know, you're trying to wrestle with language. And I will go on mute until the motorcycles pass. We can both come off mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you feel compelled to start or you want me to start? I would like you to start. <laughs> no worries, of course. Um, I mean, I think, in in that poem, Lewis Nude, I mean, part of what it's reckoning with is like, I am not only ever me. That can be like liberating and that can be um, oppressive. But in the sense of like, there's always a community with me when I'm alone writing. And that is like ancestral. That's people who I return to that's a community of writers and the legacy of writers um, like Gwendolyn Brooks and Lisa Clifton and June Jordan. Um, and then the, the, the contemporary, like my, you know, sisterhood. Um, and all of those people are present. And I think there's also just like, being the, the work of being an artist and um, knowing that I'm fortunate enough to have that vocation. And so even if I don't know someone or even if they're dead, they're a part of my, my life and a part of my circle and a part of how I continue to exist on the planet. So I'm in conversation with all of that, including the trees, <laughs> including the trees. 
Um, and I, I guess I really can't stress how enough, how fortunate I feel to be able to be a poet. I mean, no one's making me be a poet. <laughs> um, I, I get to sit down at a desk and, and write and think and help, like uh, it helps me exist in the world. It helps me feel compassion and connection to the planet and to beings and creatures um, and to humans. So yeah, I feel connected to Aurora, for example, even though we've never met. <laughs> um, and all of this is just like a river that I get to dip into and contribute to. Um, so that's what I would say. I love that. Um, I live near a river and so I think yeah, trying to be in conversation with movement, um, the seasons, the land, the bodies of water, um, listening. I think listening is like the thing I want to do most in the world. Um, and I think that I write in order to figure out how to live better. So the questions are often about reckoning with history, um, about love, about my mom. <laughs> um, she's a, a, a single parent and I'm an only child. So our, our relationship is sort of the, the way that I learned about the world and about power and violence and love. Um, mm -hmm. And I think too, like, when I think about lineage, I, I often think about the future and about who's to come. I feel like they are wise. Like, I feel like I hold a baby and they talk to aliens, you know? There's this uh, strange and magical knowing. And they are like amphibians, right? They lived in a water world and they come out and they breathe air and it's, it's impossible, um, but it is how we exist. And, uh, and so in that vein, I think that I'm in, always in deep conversation with my friends because they are the family I'm trying to build with over and over and over again. And yeah, they're, they're the ones who teach me how to love better and how to live better. It is um, no surprise that you both are educators um, and community builders. Um, as much as you listen, you give. And I'm curious because in this series, um, Healing Futures, all six of the poets really connect lineage to futurity as you just talked about Aurora. Um, and in one of your poems, you talk about how do we remember the praxis of the future? Um, which is so beautiful. And I'm curious, I'd love to hear from you both, um, how it is that you touch grief in the language and how do you also replenish? Or in other words, where is like, in your own work or the work of others, how do you find marvel in grief? And this is also open to folks who are in the community. Like, what do you find marvelous in grief? Mm -hmm. I think it opens. I think that um, the people who I've witnessed who have lived through <laughs> profound grief they become somebody else and they hold that person alive in their bodies and that, yeah, there's a birth that happens, it seems like, um, for those who are in grief. And I think that we, as humans, have always lived in, in a, a moment of grief. Like there's always violence, systemic and, and interpersonal, you know, and. Uh, and so to be alive is to be grieving. And 
I think when I open to grief, I, I open to more joy. I've been trying to go to the river at night and like sit in the moonlight and, and scream and wail and weep. Um, and that's been my like process of, of grieving this, these past months. Um, and it feels like an opening. Mm -hmm. There was this heron that flew towards me in the middle of the night and eclipsed the moon with its wings. Like grief opens. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah I mean I think it's in that I don't know where it is it's in that poem so to make an alphabet of a stammering a song of a cry to be anything buzzing with blood or wings anything alive including grief I mean that's that's it <laughs> You know, the liveness that you just spoke of, Aurora, I mean, that's a part of being alive is grief. And um, and just had that image of the bridge of you, of the speaker of the poem looking out into the water and, you know, to be here on planet earth. <laughs> existing in, you know, the intersections we exist in and to acknowledge, like to acknowledge that, right? It's, it's all like we're, we're carrying it and there's gotta be grief there. <laughs> like if we're at all um, acknowledging harm and if, if we're alive, yeah, so we're alive. So there's grief and I, there's not a like romanticization of that. It's just like, that is a fact. And, and the end of that poem, which I actually, um, I don't wanna necessarily explain, but there's something about what I think of as my ancestors work in bringing me to this place that I wanna honor in my life even in my grief. Um, yeah, what, what did, why did, why did they pass through this time if I can't do that work, so. Thank you both. And thank you, Ryan and Sylvia for also lifting up connection and grief as part of love. Um, yes, all of that. I am curious, what, Aurora, you spoke about sort of descendants and again, the sense of futurity, what's possible. And I'm curious if y'all were to kind of put a wish or a spell of possibility out in the world, what would you want it to be? The end of domination. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, the river that you visit and, and the trees that are my friends and like a connection to earth um, and to a pace that is, uh, that is aware of of the sun crossing the sky. Um, so not a machine pace, not a computer pace, but a being pace. I mean, that would be my wish that we, that we could have more of that, that we could return to that. Um, yeah. I think if I would replace domination, it would be with tenderness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, soft. Uh, and not that, like, I think that tenderness is often the most courageous. Uh, to be intimate, to be seen is terrifying. And to be held is terrifying. To ask for help is terrifying. And so, yeah, I think to, to remake the way that we think of courage. Mm. What you just said, Aurora, also reminds me of um, 
So as many folks may know, Aurora offers these generative writing work, just sessions for people, writers to gather. And again, um, you know, she and Ama are amazing community builders. And um, one of the folks who's worked with you, Kata has said, in a tender manner, she always told me what I needed instead of what I wanted to hear. And I love how you embody that tenderness that you hope to see. And I think when I reach both of your poetry, I feel exactly that too, that there is a tenderness that I have been longing for that is now embodied here. So thank you both for the gift of your poems. Um, I want to give everyone a chance to just shower some love in the chat. Um, I also, we are going to end with poems. Um, so before I do, I wanted to let you know that even though we will have a final set of poems from Ama and Aurora, that there will be more poetry in this series coming up. Um, we will have Healing Futures, Ghosts of the Future in two weeks on May 20th um, with Zakia Henderson Brown and Heidi Andrea Restrepo Rhodes. And that evening also will be just full of echo, full of sound, full of question, full of inquiry, and full of radiance. So I hope you all will come back that evening as well. I'm going to pass it over to Aurora and then to Amma to close us out with language. Thank you. Um, so I'll read two poems to close. The first I'll read is the one uh, that's in the broadside. And then I'll read a love poem about my friends because <laughs> that seems right. Um, so the poem is called We Gentle Beasts. And it's thinking about the bees. Just have to find it. We gentle beasts. With their full hips and bright light eyes, the carpenter bees thrum around our thighs like we might be honey. And maybe we are. Maybe three women in a backyard, sweat-soaked and sun-slick, beer-drunk and ruckus are all the honey I need. What rare a gift to share the air with them, these winged beings, melody making their bodies. We will not always have this, the bees, the buzz, each other. How long since my mother spoke to her sister, I picture them girls in Dhaka, the hems of their sharis hiked to their knees, football juggled between their sandaled feet, shins dust caked and red. Their laughter an orchard only their two voices can see. What time can break, how it barrels through us, how if we're not listening, we collapse in its wake, bordered, barbed, empty. This morning, a bee's carcass rotted in my kitchen sink caught in the cold metal drain like a clot of hair, far from nectar, cedared place, any daughter she'd called home. I lifted her body, the wet sack of her corpse, ferried her to the pinewood edge of the yard, sawdust chatter of the living. The truth is, I'd seen her stumbling along the sill and I did not save her. Who did she long for as she died? Who will I? Tell me we return. Whatever we've done, no matter how gone, let us return. And the next poem is called Taproot, which is the central root of, of a tree. Scrolling, scrolling. <laughs> Thank you for waiting.
taproot for all my loves, especially Sasha. I picture you at our table, your long salted locks down to the small of your back. I imagine your kid crawling between the chair's weathered red legs, cerulean crayon tucked beneath his chin. Prepared, an artist from the day he arrived. I imagine us cackling, the kind that brings me to the floor. You repeating the same line again, again, giddy at my giddiness. But why, you ask? Seriously, tell me why. Through time's unhinged longing, we've become kin. And this house, which is my house, is also yours. Every winter when the Chicago snow leaks in through the wind window's cracked ceiling, you come here. This year, your mother too, frying up plantains in the kitchen and my own small child cooing in her crib. Soon, Lisa and Jay will clamor through the swollen oak door. Too many bags for just a weekend, so they'll stay longer. All of us bowing to the beach's windy prayer. Together, we'll walk side by side like this, through tide and miscarriage and madness and decade. I dream this house now because I am alone, because I have been alone most of my life. I dream this house because I want you to know I will love you until I am ash. I've spent so many years half dead, buried beneath my fear, love's carnivorous demand, my heart's tepid scarcity. I don't know how to unlearn it, so I do what I can. I pick up the phone. You play us a song, some old Britney remix born again, and in our faraway homes we dance the way we did once in that strange white hippie town. The club, PBR stained, empty and full of grace. The church that is midnight and base. How we twerked against the wall every Saturday in December. Sober as we dragged our sore thighs home, sweaty, spent, a little less depressed. We may never live in the same city again, but we will be a family, whatever shape that takes. We will eat and fight and weep. We will grow into the give no fucks crones we've always wanted to be. I see us now, 90, on a porch, smoking cloves, howling into the spark studded night, brazen, ancient, alive. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I am. Um... I'm going to share in response a family woven like night through trees. The man asks, do you have a family? My thinking brushes the air between us like a wet mark stains white paper. My mother's mother dead 22 years, a stone house, the ants I've killed Robin, who, when someone hurls toward me a, a small cruelty, cries. Memphis and August, my twin brother crunching ice, all the cousins I've made, walking amongst cedar trees. New Yorkers on New Year's Day or on the first day of spring, not children I've birthed, but dead leaves raked into prickly hills made messy with our falling. Artists skinny dipping in the ocean at night. It was family that surged and fell away. But the ties my grandfather wore on Sundays are kite tails in my closet. The mums my mother planted are tiny decadent flames. Family returns like a sun, the way a wave is always and never the same. For once, it is not about the body. I listened, I listened as my friend's urge to kill herself grew clamorous as a field of bells. She stank of it. Her voice reeked, streaked with ringing. And as if she were wreathed in baby's breath, cloaked in a robe of dianthus, as if she'd been washed by a river stripped of silt and mud, I drew her close, inhaled her musk, and brought her brow to mine. I mean to say her blood was mine. 
And this is blueprint for Purvey. As I lay on the prickly grass, grasshoppers chattered in my hair. I stroked the ground like a beard. No one sang. The whole sky was watching. It's animal piss in the dye pot that makes indigo blue. Blue seeped out of me, but I wanted to forge it myself. I was obsessed with making. The yellow leaves browned, the sugar pine needles refused to shed. I couldn't get the pigment right. It kept turning to mud. I had attempted this before, making wine from another's body stamping and stomping my grape stained feet. When I rose, I left the print of a woman behind. I noticed the pear tree, how it gave without question. I asked anyway, was asking again, collecting broken seashells and tiny elephant figurines. I needed a herd of blue. I soaked black beans for the color they left. My blue was a habit, a kind of river I stepped into, sometimes crossed because it held the sky so perfectly. I swung the ax. I swam with my arms. I hammered nails, though crookedly. Timber was my sacrum. Timber were my metatarsals. Timber was my lungs, pink flesh. Timber was my skull. I was a blueprint, blue on blue. Mapless, but for those warm bones and my red heart barking. And when I turned without making my skirt a basket, when I turned from all the fallen pears, the sky was full of shaking, wet with river water. It wasn't rain that fell. Whatever it was, I collected in the cups of my hands. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Have a beautiful night with the cups of your hands. <laughs>